First Peter chapter number 3. We'll read one verse of scripture today for our text verse, and uh, I hope you'll pay attention to this verse of scripture. This is a verse that we could spend several services on, and uh, I just want to kind of highlight it this morning for just a few minutes. And uh, before, I, uh, before I read this verse, I, uh, I just want to say this. The heaviest burden that I carry as a pastor is the burden of the salvation of people's souls. There's a lot of burdens, burdens for a pastor to carry. But I wrestle with this. I wrestle with it every week of my life. Times untold, I, uh, I think about what if somebody that I preach to every week of my life who hears the message and yet they don't hear it and they die and go to hell that weighs heavily on me and I've had people to say to me down through the years why do you preach so often on people being saved I said because that's the most important message I've got you can preach messages and try to get people to live better, and I, I'm for people living better, but you don't go to heaven by living better. You go to heaven by knowing Jesus as your Savior. This verse today in, in the text, I think, hits right to the heart of the matter. And I'll not be able to preach it all this morning. I don't know if we'll continue it, but I, I want you to follow me. In First Peter chapter number 3, and verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now it's so powerful and so important. I want to read it one more time. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that you have laid this verse of Scripture heavily upon my mind, my spirit, my heart, my person this week. You know I've wrestled with it all week. In the daylight hours, in the evening hours, in the night hours, I've thought about it. And Lord, I know if you've laid this message so heavily upon my own heart, there has to be a purpose and there has to be a reason. So I want, Lord, to be the instrument. Like Jeremiah down at the potter's house, I want to be the clay in your hand, the potter's hand, that you can mold and you can use during these next few minutes. I ask for wisdom. I ask for anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Lord, that you give us ears to hear. And then, Lord, exclusively, I pray that the Spirit of God will have his freedom. I ask you, Lord, that he will be able to Give, impute his convicting power upon all of our lives today. 
that we may learn something from this truth. And it may change us and mold us as we leave. Lord, get honor to your precious name. Speak to us in a powerful way from your word. And I'll thank you for it. Because I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. In order to understand the setting of this verse of Scripture, I think it's important to give you the background, the context of our text. If you'll notice with me in the first chapter of the book of First Peter, we are told to whom this letter is given. It is sent to a bunch of Christians whom the Bible says, verse number one, who are scattered. Now the reason they are scattered is because of persecution. When these Christians identified with the Lord Jesus, they became the hated, despised people of that era. They worked in something like guilds, and many of the Christians were dismissed from the guilds. They couldn't provide income for their families because, because of the fact they were Christians. They were made fun of. They were mocked, severely ridiculed. They were imprisoned. Many of them died for their faith. God had to send, however, persecution to the Christians in Jerusalem. Because instead of following the Great Commission and leaving Jerusalem and going to Judea, Samaria, and eventually to the uttermost parts of that world to give out the gospel, they had settled down at ease in Zion in Jerusalem. God sent persecution, loud persecution to come upon them. And as the persecution came upon these Christians, they left Jerusalem and they went out to the other parts of the world. The word here in verse number one is they were scattered. Scattered like sowing seed out in the field. Scattered from town to town and scattered city to city. Sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you'll notice in our text chapter, chapter number three, Right above our text verse, in verse number 14, it says, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. If you'll notice, the Bible also reminds us in the fourth chapter, verse number one, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. All through the book of First Peter, you will find the word, our words, suffer and suffering. No less than 15 times in the first epistle of Peter, he talks to them about their suffering. And as we come down today to our text in view of, in light of all of the suffering these Christians are enduring, Peter says this, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now let's analyze that just a minute. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The word sanctify is a word which means to set apart. Let me illustrate it. This building today is a sanctified building. This property here is sanctified property. What I mean by that is this property and this building are set apart. This building is not here in this community to act as a grocery store. This building is not here in this community to act as a medical facility. 
This building is not here in this community to act as a garage to work on automobiles. This building and this property is sanctified. That is, it is set apart for a specified purpose. And the specified purpose here is to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I was in a place visiting this week, and uh, a couple of people looked at me, and of course, uh, I try to wear a tie everywhere I go. That's almost getting out of date today. And this person looked at me, and they said, you're overdressed for this environment, aren't you? I said, I come here today representing the King of Kings. And I believe as I represent the King of Kings, I ought to put my tie on, and I want to represent him well. I was checking out at uh, Sam's the other day, and the lady that was uh, ringing me up, she looked at me, and she looked at me the second time, and she said, you are either a judge or an attorney. I said, wrong, wrong. I am a preacher. I am a pastor. I represent the king. Now, I want you to understand that things are sanctified and set apart. The word sanctified also comes from the word we get our word holiness from. It just means that God has sanctified us. That doesn't mean we're sinless. But it does mean if we're saved, we sin less. And it means that we are sanctified and we are set apart. Now, wait a minute. Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are going through intense persecution. And in the midst of the intense persecution, he said, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, what's he saying to this crowd? Peter is saying to this crowd, hear me well, because the same truth applies to all of us today. Peter is saying, if you make it, Peter is saying, if you get through this, Peter is saying to these persecuted Christians, if you survive, you've got to sanctify the Lord God. In other words, here's what he's saying. You've got to set Jesus Christ apart in your life as the person you go to when all of hell is ripping loose around you. You're going to have to sanctify the Lord God. You're going to have to set him apart. Because the question that we have to raise today is where do we go when difficult times arise? What do we do when downtime comes in our lives? To whom do we turn? To what do we turn? Where do we go when we have no answers to the question? To whom do we turn when there's no visible solution in sight? What do we do? Well, Peter says to this group of Christians, when they're, while they're putting you in prison, while they're scourging you, while they're firing you, while you are suffering along with your families, he said, I want to point you to the source of help. I want you to understand where you go to get assistance. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set him aside. May he be your first option, not your last option. May he be your, your first place of resort, not your last place. And Peter said the only way in the world you're going to make it. The only way in the world you will survive, the only way in the world you will get through this is to set the Lord Jesus Christ apart in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart, and you turn to him uh, first of all, and you turn to him foremost, as Peter said, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. May we learn that lesson today. But may we also learn in our text verse, please watch this closely. The person to whom we go is not just an ordinary person. Notice what he says. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. We're talking about a powerhouse now. 
The word Lord there in reference in this passage of Scripture is a reference, a direct reference to the Jehovah of the Old Testament. It is a reference to our Messiah when it talks about God. It is a reference, hear me well, it is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ who is called God because Jesus Christ is God. He is very God. And Peter said, I want you to understand something. To the Jew, he's talking here to a great degree. He said, I want you to understand your Messiah has come. He is available to minister to you. He's available right now. But not only is he your Lord, your master, your upholder, your sustainer, I want you to understand this person that I'm asking you to set apart in your life, he is very God of very God. And he can help you, he can assist you, and he can minister unto you. May we learn that truth today. I remember years ago when Dr. B.R. Lakin was living, he was preaching down in the state of Florida. And he had a son over in West Virginia. For, he was from West Virginia. And while he was preaching down in the state of Florida, holding a revival meeting, word came to him that his son had been killed tragically in a car accident. And naturally it broke his heart and he was weeping. And he said, I've got to cancel this meeting and I've got to drive back to West Virginia. And they said to Dr. Lakin, Dr. Lakin, we're going to drive you back. You, you, you don't need to be driving by yourself. That, that, that could be dangerous. You're, you're grieving. And uh, this, this is a terrible tragedy in your life. And we're not going to let you go by yourself. We're going to go with you. We're going to drive for you. And whatever we can do to assist you, we are available. Dr. Lakin looked at them. And he said, No. He said, this is solely between me and my God. And he said, I've got to talk to God about this. He said, I, I've, got to, I, I've got to run this by the Lord. He said, I'm going to drive my car back to West Virginia because I've got to get some answers from God. God, why do you allow these things? And I can hear Dr. Lakin right now as he said from Florida all the way back to West Virginia. He said, the Lord sent by me. And he said, the Lord comforted me. And he said, the Lord strengthened me. And he said, although I may never in this walk of life know all of the details about it, he said, I got enough assurance from God to know that he does all things well and he's still in charge, and he's still in control, and it was God's power and presence uh, that sustained me in my journey. Well, Dr. E.V. Hill, Dr. Hill was a black preacher out in California. I heard Dr. Hill preach in person here in Winston-Salem years ago. He was a tremendous preacher. His wife didn't travel with him that much. She stayed at home, but I've heard him tell the story numerous times. He said, he said, I put my wife to bed every night. didn't matter where I was at. He said, when I finished preaching, wherever I was at in the world, and he preached all over the world, he said, I'd hurriedly get to my motel room, and I'd pick up my, my phone, and he said, I'd call honey. That's what he called I'd call honey. And he said, I'd talk to her. She'd ask me how the meeting was going. And she would assure him that uh, she'd been praying for him. And, and uh, they'd chat a little while. And then he'd say, okay, honey, we're going to have our devotions now. It's time for me to read the scripture. And I'm going to have prayer with you. And then I want you to go to bed. And he said, from all over the world. He said, wherever I was preaching, I'd hurry to the motel room, pick up the phone, talk to my wife. We had devotions and had prayer, and I'd put her to bed. He said, wherever I was at. He said, oh, there's such love between me and my dear wife. Dr. Hill said on one occasion, he said, I, I got threatened. My life was threatened. He was in a bad area out in Los Angeles, California. And he said, one morning I woke up, and he said, I noticed my wife wasn't in bed. And he said it was unusual 
for, for her not to be there when I awakened in the morning. And he said, I jumped out of the bed and I started asking and calling for my wife in the house. And he said, uh, I couldn't find her. He said, in a few minutes, I noted my car coming in the driveway. And he said, I looked out the window and it was my wife. He said, my wife drove the car up and got out. And he said, I met her out on the front stoop and said, honey, what's going on? Where you been? She said, well, honey, you've gotten so many threats, threats on your life lately. I got to thinking, what if somebody rigged your automobile with some kind of explosive device and took you out? She said, I decided I'd get up this morning, take your car out, just make sure it's okay. He said, that's the kind of woman I was married to. And he said, uh, then the Lord reached down in the hospital and took my honey home. And he said, when she breathed her last breath, people with good intentions came around and put their arms on his shoulders and said, Brother Hill, we're praying for you. He said, you're all going to have to excuse me for just a minute. He said, me and God's got to have a talk. He said, I left my wife's body in that room. And he said, I went down into a little chapel on another floor. And he said, I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I'm an ignorant man. I don't know a lot of things. And I don't understand what you're doing. And I don't understand why you've taken the dearest thing in this world from me. But Lord, you're going to have to let me in on it. You're going to have to help me understand it. Dr. Hill said the presence of God and the word of God began to saturate his soul. And he said there came from heaven the answer. There came from heaven the strength and the power and the grace and the glory that he needed to get through that difficult moment, that difficult time in his life. You travel across the city of Winston-Salem today, you'll see multitudes of people whose lives have been wrecked. You'll find multitudes of people who are on alcohol and all kinds of drugs. And they're trying to find a solution. They're trying to find comfort to brokenness, to sin, to their families, everything that's happened to them, their lives, for whatever reason, they have fallen apart. They're in the swamp. But they didn't know what it meant to sanctify, to set apart the Lord God in their life. So they had to go to secondary things. They had to go to the world. If they had known the Lord, if they had set him apart in their life, they could be sitting on a church chair or church pew today, knowing what it means to have an all-sufficient God who's more than able to minister to us in the afflictions of life. I stand here today as an example of that. Not bragging on me, I'm bragging on my Lord. Man, I don't know what it is to be afflicted, to have afflictions. I know what it is to look at a hurting wife every day of my life carrying the burden and just weighted down, having to look at the suffering of the one I love so much. And yet I can still stand here today and tell you that God's good. I can stand here today and tell you that I can sanctify the Lord God and set him apart in my life. And when I come to the end of myself, I just position myself to receive the strength that I need from heaven because Paul said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. It's when we come to the end of ourselves that God can kick in and help us. And Peter says to these suffering Christians, you sanctify not just an ordinary person. You sanctify the Lord God in your life. You learn to fall upon him. You learn to call upon him. 
And may we today as a church understand and recognize that he's available. And as the first source in our lives, there will be no need to go anywhere else. Because although we may not understand what he's doing, the good news is he knows what he's doing. And I'm comforted, I'm helped, I'm encouraged in that I know that he knows. And although I can't understand what's going on, there's nothing going on that's out of his knowledge. There's nothing going on that's out of his control. There's nothing going on that he can't fix. There's nothing going on that he can't remedy. There's nothing going on that he don't have the answer to. And we ought to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. In the times of testing and suffering and persecution and sickness, may he be our first course of action. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. But now he says a second thing, and this is where I want to spend a little time. Not only does he say that we're to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, but he said we're to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason for the hope in us. I want you to look at that. I want to scrutinize that, analyze that just a minute. Because here's what's happening. I want you to watch this closely. This is like a neon light flashing off and on. These Christians who are undergoing such vast persecution have found the Lord Jesus Christ as their source of strength. And these Christians, as they're being severely tested, tried, and persecuted, have stood so steadfast for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ that the lost heathen world is coming up to them and they're saying to them, how are you doing this? How are you standing up under such persecution?" Do you see that in that verse? Notice what it says. Always give an answer to every man that asketh you. Why are they asking? Because they've noticed in these Christians, they've renounced heathenism. They've noticed in the lives of these Christians that the more they beat them and scourge them and imprison them and threaten them, the more courageously they stand up for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not quit. They will not give up. They will not compromise. They will not lay, lay, raise the white flag of surrender. They will not throw the towel in the ring. There's nothing that can stop them. Their testimony is sure. Their life is secure in the Lord Jesus Christ and their faithfulness to the Lord under adverse circumstances has sent such a message to the heathen world. They're coming up to them and they're saying, what is it you have? What is it you've experienced that's enabling you to stand under these circumstances the way you are standing? And they gave a good report. We have sanctified the Lord God in our hearts. Let me ask you a question. How long has it been since someone came up to you, a family member or somebody you work with or somebody you shop with or a neighbor? How long has it been since someone came up to you and said something like this? You're just different. I've watched you. I've observed you. I've listened to you. You're not like the ordinary, run-of-the-mill person. Uh, could you tell me, what is it that makes you different? I don't want to be true of everybody in this building. Family members ought to look at you and say, there's some areas in that person's life you don't need to challenge because they won't go there. Somebody you work with, maybe behind your back, have called you an old religious fanatic. Somebody around you recognizes there's something different about you. And when you're not around, they may make fun of you in the break room 
or out in the parking lot, they may say something detrimental about you. But I want to tell you, when the chips is down, they know where to go. Because there's somebody there that they work with that's different. There's somebody there in their presence that's just not like the ordinary people in the factory and in the plant and over to mall. You can just look at them. There's something about them that stands out. You listen to their conversation. It's not the normal conversation. You watch where they go. They just don't go where the world goes. They're just different. They're set apart. In the words of our text, they're sanctified. There's just something about them that rings true. There's something about them that sets an example that others look at and they say there's just something about them that's different. I don't know what it is, but I sure do wish I had some of it. This world's dying for that. (laughs) This world. This world is looking towards the church in so many instances and is seeing the same thing in the church that it sees in the world. The church is to be different. The church is to be a group of people saved, born again, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, with the Word of God as our textbook, our guidebook, our holy book, not full of holes, but holy, that we turn to. And when they come to us and say, what makes you different? We need to be able to stand up on our hind legs and say, I met the Savior. I know Jesus. Now you say that around some people, they'll get scared. But that's all right. That's good. This world needs to know that we're different. This world needs to know that we've been changed. Now I want you to watch this closely. He said it's vitally important that you be able to give an answer to them that ask you of the hope that you have in you. I want you to hear me well. If someone should ask you this day, what is your hope? If someone should ask you this day, How do you feel about the future? If someone should ask you this day, where will eternity find you? Can you give them the right answer? Hear me well. Can you give them the right answer? Let me tell you the answer they're not listening for. Well, I think everything's going to be all right. You don't want something like that. You don't want something half cooked. Well, me and the man upstairs, we've got it worked out. No, 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 no. No, you don't go, you don't go there. Well, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Hear me well. You can walk into the pit of hell feeling good. You need more than a feel good experience. You need to know. Hear me well. You need to know that you have a profession of faith that you can explain theologically. Now, I don't mean to get out in the weeds, and I don't mean that you have to write a 300-page discourse. But you need to have had such a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that you can sit down And you can say to that individual that may ask you of the hope that you have within you, you can say to that individual, I want to tell you who I used to be. I want to tell you what happened to me. And I want to talk to you about my future. And you need to be able to substantiate it with Scripture. You need to know biblically why you claim you have the hope for eternity in your soul. And if you can't explain it biblically, 
You need to back up and look at your experience to find out if, in fact, you have the goods that will separate you from the chaff and the wheat. Because if you are saved, you need to be able to say more than, well, I feel good about it, or, or I had this dream, or, or my parents uh, were Christians, or my parents had me baptized, and all of this other stuff. You're going to have to get beyond that, my friend. You're going to have to know scripturally that you have done what the Bible has asked you to do. And it's not how you feel. It's not even what you think. If your thinking is not based upon the Word of God, you need to be able to take the Bible today and say, look, to you, to those that ask you for the hope that you have within you, you need to be able to take the Bible today and say, look, my eternity is secure. My future is settled. Let me show you from the Bible what I've done. Let me show you what God did for me. Let me show you about my future. It's right here. I've got a hope not based on my feelings, but based on the fact of the Word of God. The tragedy of tragedies in this hour is that when you ask people about eternity, very seldom, very rarely, do they bring biblical interpretation into the scenario. Hear me well. You need to be able theologically to understand what's happened to you if you're saved to the extent you can share it biblically with somebody else. Now, you don't have to go off to a Bible college to do that. You, if you're saved, you know about your past. If you're saved, you know there was a time in your life when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ and He forgave you. And if you're saved, you know today you're different. You're not what you was before you met the Lord. Your life is not like it was back there before you met the Lord. And you want to go to the Word of God and you want to tell people, look, here's what Jesus done for me. I was a sinner and I know that He came down here to save me and He died for me. He took my place on Calvary. He was buried. He got up and went back to heaven to justify me and to be my propitiation and to be my sin bearer and, and to be my advocate with the Father. I know my sin sins are forgiven because he said whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not by feeling, it's by the fact of the word of God. Can we take the Bible and say from the scripture, I'm going to glory, not on my feeling. I'm standing on the unthink God, unmovable truth of the word of God. I know what the hope is I have within me and I want to tell you about the hope. In fact, you ought to be happy that somebody would ask you. You know, I'll tell you something. I've met some people in my life, you talk to them about their salvation, they get upset. If you got the goods, you're not going to get upset. You're going to say, hallelujah. After you spill on them about 50 times, preaching to them about what Jesus means to you, they'll get the idea you might have the goods. I look suspect at people that don't want to talk about their conversion. I hear people say, well, it's really none of your business. Yes, it is. The Lord has commissioned us to tell everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. A preacher years ago was uh, uh, preaching in a foreign city, and uh, he came in a motel one night in the lobby, and there was a lady standing over there, and he said, I could tell that she was on the wealthy side of society, and he said, I decided I'm just going to talk to her about her soul. And he said, I went over there and started talking to her and, and uh, said uh, she acknowledged she was a sinner. And uh, he said, I just got to the place where I was going to ask her to pray and ask God to save her. And her husband walked up and said, man, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm trying uh, to tell your wife how to be saved. He said, we don't need you. You leave. And then he said, after the preacher left, he said to his wife, why didn't you tell that preacher to mind his own business? She said, I think he was. His business was to tell somebody about Jesus. Paul said, you need to have this hope. 
And you need to have, you need to be able to tell other people about the hope that you have in you. Can you tell somebody else today about what, what it means to you to be saved from the Bible? Can you share with somebody else today what's happened to you? Paul said it's biblical for you to be able to tell people about the hope you have. Look, our hope is beyond the grave. Our hope's not in this world. Our hope is in the world to come. But thank God we're plugged into it in this world. Amen. I'll give you this in closing. I don't have time to do it. I hadn't even got started. But I want you to turn in closing to the book of Acts chapter 22. I want you to, I want you to see something just a minute. In closing, I close long, but I want you to see something. The Apostle Paul is giving a, a brief resume of his life. Notice Acts chapter 22. Men and brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew, Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silent. Now I want you to notice how he testified about his relationship with Jesus. First of all, he talked about his birth. He talked about his past life. Look at this. I am verily man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. You know, one of the greatest testimonies you can have is to go back to where you came from. That's what Paul did. He said, I want to tell you who I, who I am versus who I was. And then, not only did he talk about his birth, he talked about a high point in his life, his education. He said, uh, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliah and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous towards God as you all are this day. He said, here's my past. I was born in the town of Cilicia. He said, I was educated, set at, set at the feet of the greatest known scholar of that day. But then, I want you to notice in verse number four, he talked about what happened back there. He said, here's the way I was. I persecuted this way. Under the death and binding and delivering into prison both men and women. As also the high priest that bear me witness and all the state of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound into Jerusalem for to be punished. Notice how he's talking about his wicked life, the things he thought he was doing for the cause of Christ. Talked about his birth, talked about his education, talked about his past life. But he said, I want you to understand I stand here today because something happened to me. <laughs> Something happened to me, and it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around about me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Now the Bible said no man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Spirit. He got in immediately. But I want you to notice something. Verse number 6. Are all of these verses, he talked about his past, his birth, his education, his lifestyle. But when he met Jesus, I want you to look at verse number six. He said, I know where I was at when I got saved. I was nigh unto Damascus. And he, knew, he said, I know what time it was. It was about noon. He said down there near Damascus about noon. I met the Savior. And as he said to the church of Philippi, what I thought was gain to me, he said, now I realize it was table scraps. It was nothing. And I gave it all up that I might win Christ for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Hear me well. We're going to have the invitation. Jesus was real to Paul. He can be real to you. He wants to be real to you. If you're saved, he wants to be real to you. 
But if you can't explain today what it means to be saved, you might need to get around this altar for a little while and find out if you're really saved. Because salvation is not what I think. Because what I think might not be based on the truth of the Word of God. I need to know what the Bible says. I'm a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus took our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. The word believe means commit my life to him. My all. I give him all of it. I've only made a mess out of my life. I need to turn it over to somebody that can straighten it out. And Jesus can do that. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to say, first of all, if you know you're saved, please hear me closely. How real is Jesus to you? How real is he to you? Peter said, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set him apart. Set the Lord apart in your life as the most important person in your life? Secondly, if there's no way in this world you can really describe salvation, you need to take the advice of Peter when he said, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give to anybody that might ask you the reason for the hope that you have down in your soul. I want to ask you a question today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The quartet is going to sing in just a moment. How many be here today and you say, Preacher, I know that what you preached is the Bible. I know it's exactly so. And I realize today as a Christian, many times I don't go to him as my first choice. And I, I need to do so. I feel convicted that many times I go other places and I may grumble and gripe and complain. I don't handle that the way I should. I need to sanctify the Lord in my heart. I need to put him out there first and foremost in my life. Pray for me that I will all over the building. Thank you so much. I wonder if you're here today and you'd say, I just, I, I would have a problem today taking the Bible and explaining my conversion. I'm concerned about that. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up in the building anywhere? Thank you. Thank you. Someone else. Someone else. Father, you know the needs here today. Oh, my God, help us today to know that it's settled between here and eternity. Lord, help us today to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Help us today to be able to intelligently, spiritually explain to others what our relationship with you really means. Speak to hearts now during this invitation, I pray. And I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. They're going to sing in just a moment, just before they do. If you raised your hand about doubts on your salvation, I want you to slip out. we got folks that's going to pray with you right now. Come on. Just slip out and let us pray with you. Let's get it settled. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Come on right now. If you are saved and you just acknowledge, hey, I need a closer walk with my Lord. I need to enjoy what it really means to be saved. Just slip out and come to this altar. Let's put it on this altar today as the quartet sings this invitation. Would you come?